Hebrews chapter 4, the writer says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of, of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. I'll read verse 5 again. In this place they shall not enter my rest. And so... The writer, and let me, let me again lay a foundation, move us into chapter 4. The writer of Hebrews has just made a very important point. He has just said that professing Christians, those who claim to know Christ are simply professing him, those who profess to be Christians but actually reject Jesus, returning to Judaism, are exhibiting the same kind of unbelief that their fathers, the Jewish uh, patriarchs, and not the patriarchs, but the Jews previous to them, the unbelief their fathers had exhibited. And so the point he's making, and we'll be picking this up in just a moment, is within the confines of the congregation will be those who are informed. In every church service, in other words, the average person in our day who comes to church, who will go to a church service, they may be informed. There may be people who come, there always are, if you have a group of people, there will always be somebody who comes in who's been informed, who, in other words, can give you some of the some of the things, the incidentals of, of the gospel, they can tell you things about who Jesus is and all of that. They're able to speak concerning him, but they're still unsaved. There are a lot of people who are able to answer certain questions, and this is basically the, the background that we're going to be using to, to develop chapter 4. Um, these are people who are informed, but they're still unsaved. There are always people who are in a church service who may be informed, but they still haven't given their lives to Christ. And, and these would be the ones that the writer is speaking to. He's speaking to the ones who have information, but no transformation because they've never received Christ. He's saying that they, they have heard the word of God being preached, but they're rejecting what is being said. Now, these particular Jews that he's referring to were familiar with the claims of the gospel. They had left the Jewish religion. They were attending Christian services but in spite of this, they have yet to really receive, fully embrace Jesus as their Messiah. And that's why he made this statement. Those not embracing Christ, he's saying, are unbelievers. And unbelievers will not enter into his rest. Now, what does he mean when he writes about finding rest? What does it mean when he's speaking about entering into rest? Well, obviously, the word rest means to, to cease from work of any kind of act or any kind of action. In other words, it's, it's speaking about uh, giving up on self-efforts to save yourself. So rest is the cessation of work of any kind. Rest is freedom from anxiety. It, it speaks of being inwardly quiet. It speaks of being peaceful and free of guilt. When you're speaking about rest, you, you lie down in rest so you're no longer anxiously seeking for God because you're settled in Him. It speaks of remaining confident, enjoying an unshakable trust in God's salvation. You're leaning on Him. You're leaning on Him for eternity. And we lean on the Lord confident and secure in Him. And that's what He's speaking about with these who are not entering into His rest now. What is prompting him to write concerning these things? Well, it's important to know that he's writing as a concerned shepherd, concerned for the salvation of the sheep. And that's why he's exhorting them. That's why he is continuing his exhortation here into chapter 4. Again, notice in verse 1 how he begins and he says, Since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. A promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear. A promise remains. God's promise that he has given in the past is still in effect. But make sure that you receive his promise. In other words, there's still opportunity to be saved. There's still an opportunity to come to him. There's still an opportunity to enter into his rest. The Bible tells us in 
Isaiah 45, 22, God says, Look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I'm God. There is none else. In Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that hears say, Come, and let him who is thirsty come, and whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So the invitation remains. God is saying, if you will, if you desire, then come to me. But he goes on and he says, lest us fear, uh, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Lest any of you seem to have come short of it. The word seem uh, is, a, is a Greek word that, that just simply means to suppose or to think, uh, to be of a certain opinion. Lest you think or suppose that it's too late to enter into his rest. Someone said, no one should be misled into thinking that he has come short of God's rest by following Christ alone, apart from the Old Testament ritual. Some thought that they had fallen short unless they resumed all the rites and ceremonies of the Old Testament system. So the writer is making it clear that this is not so. You enter into the rest of Christ who fulfilled all things that were necessary for you to be saved is what he's saying. And so there's only one way to enter into rest, and that's to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Notice how he says, though, let us fear. Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Let us fear. When he speaks concerning that, the point he's simply making is that we need to remember how God treats unbelief. Reject the temptation of falling into the trap of what has been called works righteousness. Under the Jewish law, there were those who had fallen into the trap of thinking that their works would produce righteousness in them. And he's saying, beware that you enter into the trap of works righteousness. Because if you rely on the law of Moses, you reject God's saving grace. And so he's speaking concerning that. And that's why in verse 2, he says, The gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So what was the gospel? Well, the gospel had given a promise. The gospel in the Old Testament had given a promise, and the promise would be referred to today as salvation rest. And the error that they have is that they're not acting on the promise. They're not combining or mixing the word, that promise that has been given, with faith in the word that has been given. And so hearing without trusting isn't enough. To be saved, we are to hear, believe, and then we'll produce fruit that demonstrates that we've actually entrusted ourselves to God. So hearing the gospel by itself, just hearing the words that are spoken, isn't enough. By faith, we are to believe, and by faith, we're to act on what we hear. In Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We saw this in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, where Paul had said, We also thank God continually. Because when you, the Thessalonian church, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. So it's one thing to hear, it's another thing to embrace. And he's saying, you might hear, but you'll fall short because you didn't embrace. You didn't get transformed. So he goes on in verse 3 and says, we who have believed do enter the rest. So assurance is given to believers. We can rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Why can't I rest in that? Because I believed. Because I received the message of God. I received Christ. And it's promised that Jesus gives. John, uh, we see it throughout the scripture. Uh, for an example of, of, of saying we've believed and have received and therefore have life. John 3.36 where it says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. God's wrath remains on him. So we have believed, and therefore we can enter into what is called salvation rest. In 1 John 5, 11 through 13, this is the testimony 
God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. He who has the son has life. And he who does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I am sending you. I'm writing you these things so you can have certainty of your salvation. Salvation is something that you can know for certain that you have. I got saved. I'm excited. And I'm really excited for two weeks. And then into the second week of being a Christian, I start having my doubts. And so I, I give a call to my friend, my friend George, who stood with me the day I got saved. And I said, man, I'm having a crisis of faith. And he says, what's wrong? And I said, I just don't feel saved. So I, I wonder how many of you, probably all of us really at one time, has, have said that I don't feel saved. Well, maybe it's because you weren't at that time. That's always a possibility. But also, maybe you were like me. You had put your faith in your feeling. And when I first got saved, I was exuberant. When I first got saved, I had this joy. When I first got saved, I was excited. But after a while, that initial kind of fire began to dull. And now I'm calling my friend George, and I'm saying, I'm not, I don't think I'm saved, George. Well, why do you think you're not saved? Because I don't feel. And so I learned a long time ago that my faith is, is in the fact, and the fact produces the feeling. But if I have this feeling first, then it's going to be backwards. And I'm going to be living my Christian life on how I feel rather than the promises I've received. So if you have the son, you have life and you can know this for certain. So it's not based on how you feel today. It's based on what he has said. Our God doesn't lie. And when he gives a promise, he keeps it. And so he's saying, um, those who haven't received me, well, they'll not enter my rest um, because they have heard, but they haven't acted on it. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, it, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name, drive out demons and perform many miracles. And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You are people who had heard but never entrusted yourself to me. You think you were doing things in my name when in fact you were just doing things, period. So there are those who hear, but they don't embrace. And that's what he's speaking about. These people will not enter my rest. In verse 3, he goes on and he says, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, after the world was created, God had initiated, and we'll see this. This is a theme that's going to be repeated. We'll look at it more closely in a different light next time or soon. But after the world was created, God initiated the period of rest. In the book of Genesis, in uh, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, by the seventh day, uh, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So he rested from his work of creation, and this rest began on the seventh day. And so he's speaking about the works being finished from the foundation. 4, verse 4 he goes on to say, he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. And so God has spoken in a certain day of the seventh day in a certain way. Genesis chapter 2, Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 31, verse 17, makes reference to the seventh day of rest and rest. God rested from all his works. That includes the work of salvation. Now, we need to remember that salvation is not an afterthought. After Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, well, that's not when God decided he's going to save man. 
Salvation is not an afterthought. It is something already anticipated and prepared for. So when you read your Bible, in Revelation 13, verse 8, it speaks of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When Peter was writing in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, speaking of Jesus, Peter said he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So salvation is not an afterthought. It was in something God had indeed planned to do. And so the Sabbath, when it was initiated, the Sabbath rest was actually a symbol for believers who are resting in their Messiah, resting in Jesus. And the Sabbath is a picture that represents the finished work of Christ. That's why there's no work done, because no work needs to be done. So Jesus fulfilled the picture. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says it like this. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. He said, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So salvation is in Jesus. He is our Sabbath rest. And so those rejecting Jesus are rejecting the rest of salvation. So that's why he says again in verse 5, he says, They shall not enter my rest. Through disobedience, they didn't enter into the rest of their souls in glory. This was a full and comfortable, blessed rest for eternity, but they didn't enter in. So verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, I don't remember saying it, but apparently <laughs> saying in David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. The remains that some must enter in. The generation under Moses didn't enter the promise, and therefore the promise remains to be fulfilled. Israel's earlier failure didn't mean that the promise no longer was offered. So, verse 7 says, he designates a certain day, saying, in David. Now, David, King David, was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this particular psalm. He had written this particular psalm that he's quoting 400 years or so after Moses, and it says, God says, today, if you'll hear his voice. When he says today, this is something I think every one of us ought to take to heart. It calls for immediate answer, or rather action, an immediate action. There should be no delay in coming to Christ. There, there should be no, I'll hear you later on this. When the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, respond. I have never met anybody who has ever said to me, not yet, perhaps somebody in this room will do it and come up and say, oh, I'm, I've never had anybody approach me who has ever said to me, I wish I would have waited to come to faith in Christ. I've never met a single person who ever has. Never. The ones I have spoken to who have spoken on that, in that way have said, would to God I would have come earlier. I wish I'd have come to faith in Christ. I would have saved myself so much pain. I would have saved my family so much pain. I would have saved so many people so much pain. And, and I, I say that. Would to God that I would have come to Christ the first time I heard the gospel preached. So many others would not have been hurt by the things I did to them. And so delaying in salvation is never a good thing. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, that's why Paul said, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's not next week, it's not next month, it's not next year, it's not after you finish partying a little bit or grow too old to sin anymore. Because I used to think, you know, when I get older, I'll, I'll be too old to sin. And when I get real old, I'll get saved. I really thought that way, I really did. You know, I'm just, I'm young, I, you know, I've got a lot of things to do. I, I got a lot of sinning to do. A lot of parties to go to. A lot of things to do. And when I'm too old to the sin anymore and then I discovered later on as I've grown older there's no sinner like an old sinner you know 
you just get in the habit of sin. It becomes your lifestyle. And then you're remaining in that rut because you don't think there's anything else you could have. So coming to faith in Christ early, I wanted my children to know Jesus early. I want my grandchildren to know Jesus early. I don't want them delaying. I want them to know him now. I want God's blessing on them now. I want them to have a lifetime of his blessing. That's what I want. And, and you should never put off your time of salvation. God's offering it to you at this moment. He's saying, you can have it now. Today is the, is the day. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not after. I've had people say, well, you know what, after I get married. No, no, you, you don't want to go to hell before you go to heaven. No, don't get married. Um, <laughs> now is the acceptable time. Well, anyway... If you hear his heart, his voice rather, do not harden your hearts. If Joshua, verse 8, had given them rest, uh, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. And so if Joshua, he's speaking to Moses' assistant. Joshua was the one who took um, took over leadership of Israel after Moses ha had died. And uh, Joshua was the one who brought the nation of Israel into the land of Canaan. He brought them into the land, but Joshua did not bring them into the rest of salvation. And that's the point he's making. If Joshua had given them rest, he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Joshua did not bring them into salvation. What he did is he brought them into something physical, the land. But he never brought them into the spiritual, which is the rest. So spiritual satisfaction and rest, the writer is pointing out, is only found in Christ. Jesus in John 6.35 said this. He said, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. When I came to faith in Christ, I didn't say, now I've tasted of him. I wonder what Buddha has to offer. I didn't do that, did you? When I came to faith in Christ, I didn't say, now that I know Jesus, I wonder what Muhammad has to say. I didn't do that. Why? Because I, I found the bread of life. Because I didn't hunger for anything anymore. I, I, my, my spiritual thirst had been quenched. So I thirst no more. Jesus in John 6, 54 said it like this. He said, whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life. I'll raise him up at the last day. So you have the hope of resurrection because you have life within you. I satisfy your every spiritual hunger and I quench your every spiritual thirst. And so Joshua could not bring them into the spiritual rest. Jesus did. In verse 9, he goes and says, There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. So they entered the land of promise, but they didn't have spiritual rest. So entering into a relationship with God by Christ, while well, we cease from our labors. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we all know that scripture. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We did not work for righteousness. The only thing I added to my salvation were the sins I was forgiven from. I added nothing through my good works because all of my works are dirty, are filthy rags. I needed the grace of God, and that's the point. So when we come to faith in Christ, we, we cease the labor, we enter into his rest. And so as he says that, he goes on in verse 11 to say, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give 
account. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. There should be a singleness of heart, a singleness of mind that produces a diligence, a pursuit. Jesus in Matthew 7, 13 and 14 said it like this. He said, enter by the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate Difficult is a way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Let us be diligent. You begin well, continue, and end well. There are those who hear and with joy receive the word, but when affliction occurs or some kind of problem happens because of their walk with Christ or faith in Christ, or profession of faith, well, they abandon it because it never was real. This is something that once you begin, you don't end. You don't stop. You begin and you continue and you complete and you do it in the Lord Jesus Christ. You enter into this narrow gate. And there are many who are going on the broad path. But there are few who enter into the narrow one. And so we enter in through that narrow gate. Luke 13, 24 says it like this. He says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Many, I say to you, will seek to enter in and will not be able. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. So run with the intent to win. Run with the intent to finish. Run with an awareness that, that not only are you running, but you're also, you have others who are running in the same race. And, and as you're running along with them, together with them, you can encourage one another and provoke one another to continue and be faithful and to end the race that you've begun. And it's easy at certain points to say, uh, I don't know, I, I, this is difficult, this is hard. I, I feel like giving up. When I was in the, in the, in the Army many years ago now, in, the, in 1776, when I was in the Army, <laughs> when I was in the Army, I, um, I decided that I wanted to make a little more money than I was making. And so some guy from the 82nd Airborne came to our basic training and had a meeting with any who might be interested in learning how to become a paratrooper. And so we weren't making very much money at that time at all. Uh, the military didn't provide much of an income. And so if you were to go through uh, uh, jump training, parachute jump, jump training, you, you'd receive like 50 $55, I forget now, a month extra, which was a lot. That was a lot of money at that time, 50, 55, I think it was. And so I went to the meeting, and I listened to the guy, and he had these cool boots and these little wings, and, and I thought, you know, I can do that. And so I signed up for Airborne, and they sent me from, uh, from here, California, Fort Ord. They sent me to, to a place called Fort Benning, Georgia. And when I went to Fort Benning, Georgia... You go through three weeks, and it was in July in Georgia. And those of you who've ever been in, in the South during the summer, you know it is miserable. It is hot and humid. It was so hot. You'd have 90% humidity, and it would be between 90, 95 degrees every day. Every, it was miserable, miserable. And I can still remember running and you had to run. We ran everywhere. The Airborne, Airborne is known for running. So we had to run everywhere. We did PT, physical training, for hours a day, every day. Then we did jump training, and we did that every day, every day. So you get into some kind of shape at a certain point. And at the end, you go through your jump qualification. And if you, if you survive five jumps, you get your wings. That's how it works, right? You get your wings. And I earned my wings. Now they put me at Fort Bragg. So now we're in Fort Bragg, which they changed to Fort Liberty now. It makes no sense to me, to be honest with you. Still call it Bragg. So I was, I was stationed in Fort Bragg with the 82nd Airborne. And I got out of shape. I weighed 155 pounds when I went airborne. But I put on over 20, 25 pounds just eating. Now my friends are saying, we got to run. We got to be in shape. And I don't want to, but I start. So I still remember the first day my friends and I went for a run. It was a three-mile run. And I remember we ran through a forest. And as we got to, well, we ran through the forest and got to a street 
When I got to the street, I was, I was mad at myself. Why did you do this? Why are you hurting yourself? You don't need to do this. And I'm saying to myself, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I don't want to do this anymore. But as we're running, there's a black hat. There's a there's one of the one of the guys who gives orders and he's off over here on the side and he's got these young young boys who are high school age and he says you see those men there and we're running past them and i'm going like this he goes you see those men there that's airborne they're airborne and all of a sudden i went <laughs> i don't know why i just told you that story I, it just there has to be a provocation to continue the race because sometimes you get tired and want to give up. And it was a silly little thing, but the Lord taught me a spiritual lesson. He said, you run to impress others. Why don't you run to impress me? So finishing the race that you start for me is a very important thing. I learned it that way. It's a very important thing. You strive to enter in. You're not casually entering in. You're going to enter in, and probably you'll probably come in in a picture of a soldier with many wounds, but you're going to be able, able to drop your trophies at the feet of Christ and say, I was faithful to you to the end. And that's why one day you'll hear the well done, well done. So hold on. Don't let go. Keep running and watch what the Lord will do. That's a very important point. We need to... Uh, re reveal the union of our faith with the power of God. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul said, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. So hang in there and keep moving. Enter into the rest he says in verse 12, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word, in other words, distinguishes the true from the false confessor. God's word is a standard, and it reveals our thoughts and our motives, our intentions. And in the day of judgment, it's his word that exposes every heart. And it's his word that reveals our heart's content. And those who have deceived their own hearts at that time see clearly. He says in verse 13, there is no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Again, God's word exposes everything. And everything is judged by his word. Psalm 90, verse 8, beautiful scripture. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Everything is exposed. And that's why we trust in and are faithful to his commands. Jesus in John 12, 48 said it like this. He said, he who rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So the need to rest in God is urgent, and therefore it must be pursued single-mindedly. I haven't lived a completely perfect life ever as a new Christian or as a man who stands before you now after all these years. I would never point to myself as the best model of a believer in Christ. But I can say this, and I'd encourage you to the same kind of thing. But I have made a determination, and it's a daily determination, that I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. And over time, what has happened is I have become more and more solid in my walk with the Lord. And that, to me, is a very, very important thing. I need to have a singleness of mind. It, it is an attitude of, I must enter his rest. I want him, and I want him more than anything else. Because God is judging my heart. I want my heart to be pure before him and to have true faith. And that's the point he's making. Enter into his rest because you have true faith. And then finally, I'll condense this. Verses 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have a great high priest. Jesus, this is the third time, by the way, in, in this letter that he refers to Jesus as the high priest. We'll be looking at that in more detail as we continue in. But Jesus is called our high priest. Now, let me give you a few things that, might, that are important to help us to understand what he's saying here. Um, there are certain things that, that uh, Jesus is, is um, it, that this is in reference to. He is, the, he is the one who is our high priest. He's the one who has passed uh, through the heavens, is how he's saying it. In other words, he's the one who has passed into the highest heaven. He's the one who's in the throne room of God. You see, the earthly high priest would enter yearly into what was called the Holy of Holies in the Jewish temple. What he's saying is that Jesus entered into the actual presence of the Father. And so because Jesus has done so, he's saying, let us hold fast our confession. Now, that would be another appeal to the uncommitted Jews. He's saying, seeing that Jesus is our true high priest, hold fast to him. And you have a personal responsibility to do that. But you need to know, verse 15, that we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness but was in all points tempted as we are, yet, he says, without sin. Now, Jesus is God in the flesh, but his divinity didn't prevent him from experiencing our feelings and our sorrows or our pains. Uh, it's been said that the Son of God came to seek us where we are in order that he might bring us to be with him where he is. And so he completely understood our weakness. When it speaks of understanding our weaknesses, he can, uh, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. The word weakness is in reference to our limitations, the limitations of humanity. Jesus understood. Jesus sorrowed. Jesus is called, uh, uh, he was a man of sorrows. Here he is. Picture him in your mind's eye for a moment. At, at the tomb of a dear friend by the name of Lazarus. And the shortest New Testament verse is quoted there in, in John chapter 11, where it simply says that Jesus wept. So he understood. He understands your sorrow. He understands your pain. He understands your grief. He understands those things. He himself being subject to them. And Jesus was a very kind man. One of the things that, that um, the Lord began to teach me about him when I first got saved was that he was kind. He was, he was one that you could bring a child to, and, and he would actually hold the child, and he would bless that child. Now, that's kind of unusual, because even in our day, even though men have become a little more open to, to doing such things, it's still not the most common thing. And yet, when you look and you want to have the, the picture of a, of a real man, I look to Jesus and not to men of the world. And so I learned uh, when I first got saved that it was okay to cry because he wept for his friend. And I learned it's okay. It's okay. You mean men can cry? I can be fully man and still shed a tear? I have to be honest with you. My culture doesn't allow that. I only saw my father in his entire life, my entire time with him. My dad died when I was 54. No, 50. I only saw my dad cry a couple times. And his, my dad didn't shed a tear. My dad didn't tell me he loved me until I was in my late teens. My dad never gave me a kiss on the cheek like fathers will give their sons until I was a man. My father didn't do any of that. So I didn't learn how to show emotion by looking at my dad. I learned a lot of great things from my dad, but I didn't learn that. I learned that from Jesus. I learned that from seeing Jesus hold a baby. And I said, if my Savior holds babies, maybe I can. Maybe I can. Because if you brought your kid to me before and you say, look, this is your nephew, I'd say, cool. 
And I would do this, and you wouldn't even really notice. I'd just take a step back, and I'd put my hand behind. Well, that's great. What makes you think I want to hold that? You know, I was there. <laughs> After getting saved, I'm, I'm showing emotions I never had. I'm saying I love you. My wife can tell you when we first got married, I was still a new believer. And when we first got married, I didn't tell her I love you. I didn't use those words. I figured that you must be weak. Why do you need to hear that? Why should I tell you that? You already know that. Listen, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't be putting up with you. I wouldn't be married to you. You all know I'm teasing, right? <laughs> I learned to say I love you, which I never did. I learned to show emotion, which you might find interesting, which I never did. I never did until I met Christ. Then I saw him cry, and I said, it's okay. I saw him show affection. I said, I guess it's okay, because that's what a real man does. And my dad had to learn what I had to learn. My dad had to learn to say, I love you. My dad had to learn to, to show emotion. My dad had to learn those things. I had to learn those things. And there are men in this room who are still learning those things. But you can learn those things. It's not a weakness to be a real man. It's not a weakness to show an emotion. And so I watch Jesus, and I say, he loved his friend, and he cried for his friend. Then it's okay to cry. He loved children. He held them and he blessed them. Then it's okay to be tender. Jesus suffered hunger. Jesus suffered thirst. Jesus got tired. And Jesus was ridiculed. Jesus was raised in, in a, a carpenter's home. Um, in ministry, he relied on the generous care of others. Um, one time in in, in Matthew 8, verse 20, he said, foxes have dens, birds have nests. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So he understands us. Uh, Isaiah tells us in chapter 53, verses 3 through 5, he was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities, carried our sorrows, Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So as a man, he experienced temptations. His human nature, one writer said, was a battleground, yet he never sinned. When Satan tempted Jesus, he gave him the three basic temptations that he offered to Eve. It says in Genesis 3, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Well, those are the, those are the three basic temptations, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And these were the temptations Satan used against the perfect man. When Jesus was hungry, because he had gone without eating, Satan said, make these stones into bread. That's the lust of the flesh. He said to him, I will give you the world without the cross. That's the lust of the eyes. He had said, leap from the pinnacle of the temple, and all will honor and admire you. And that's the pride of life. And Jesus resisted all of the temptations. He never sinned. As God in the flesh, he could not sin. He never sinned. He had no capacity to sin. Now, in our day, if we want understanding, we have a tendency of going to those who have failed. But if you want direction from someone who never failed, you need to go to Jesus. Because he is victorious over everything. And because he is victorious, he can lead us to victory also. And that's why, verse 16, that's why we come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's judgment throne has become a throne of grace, and we can with confidence approach that throne. One last illustration, and then we'll pray. We can approach the throne because our Father is the King. 
my grandchildren, hope you don't mind me using an illustration about my brats. <laughs> Every once in a while, they're kind of like reserved. My grandkids are kind of reserved. Not all of them, but some of them are. And on occasion, they'll be with one of their little friends who may not know that they're my grandchildren. And I can usually tell that because that's when my grandchildren run up to me when I'm walking. And they'll run up to me, hi, Papa, and then they'll give me a big hug and this and that. And I'll say, okay, this kid probably doesn't know that the pastor of the church is your Papa. Now, the little kid that they're with doesn't run up to me and grab me and hug me and come close to me because he doesn't belong to me. The one who does belongs to me. And I've understood for the longest time that I can approach the king of the universe because the king is my father. He's your dad. That's why you can with confidence approach him. That's why you can come to him and you can say, Dad, Abba, Father, you're my dad. And because you're my dad, I can approach you. My children have the right to approach me any time. They'll come into my office sometimes while I'm studying. They'll just walk on into that office. And they'll just, they don't even think. They'll just walk in. And I'll just lean back in my chair, even though I'm in the midst of preparing a message. And I give them the time they need because of my children. Because they need their father. And I'll listen to them. And uh, any time you want, because of Jesus you can enter into the throne room of God himself. And you come through, not through the blood of lambs and goats, you come through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who is a lamb who was slain for you. And you can enter with a confidence that your father has time for you. And you don't have to go through all this security to get to him. I went to, many years ago, I went to a meeting in, in Washington, and, and we had a provide all this proof you had it we we had to be vetted we had to go through these different checks we had to do the whole nine yards and finally they brought us into the room so that the president could could address us and i don't have to do that all i have to do is say daddy dad and speak to him i can enter the throne room of grace anytime because of jesus anytime i can walk in don't need an appointment don't need to be vetted I just come in through the blood of Christ. And that's so much better than the blood of bulls and goats and rams and all the rituals. And so the writer would be saying, enter in through Christ because he's, he's the one you can have confidence in. And he's the one who has brought you into God's own throne room because he has paid the price, made it possible. So enter in through him.